I love talking about American Express, uh, and I love asking people, what do they think of? Like, what comes to mind when you think of American Express? And it typically falls into three or four different categories. I mean, it's pretty broad. I get some really random things, but by and large, it's like the iconic green charge card, right? Or maybe a platinum or a black card has a, a physical instantiation of membership and the services that are provided by the organization. Uh, around the holiday times, it's usually you know, uh, Small Business Saturday and like our open group and, and looking at local businesses in the local community. Uh, and then I get kind of a generational variance, and I think we have a pretty good range in here. We'd probably get both. One is uh, you talk about Twitter and Facebook kind of and in, in the partnerships that we have uh, recently, and then also traveler's checks. That certainly comes up at uh, Thanksgiving at my home, my, my uh, family, and my parents' generation. But my personal favorite image when I think of American Express is, is this one. First and foremost, uh, it's because it has a dog, and I think dogs are awesome. Um, but second, and more pertinent, I think relevant to the conversation today, is what I love about it is it really illustrates the vast amount of change that in products and services that we've provided over the last 160 years. You know, back in 1850, uh, when we were founded, we did express mail. And Shockingly, any time I've asked anyone to tell me what they think of American Express, not once has Express Mail come up. Uh, and that's where we started, which I find just, just fascinating. Uh, and I think everyone in this room clearly gets it, and actually just came up a little bit uh, in the, the last talk, is that if an organization wants to survive and live uh, more than, say, 10, 15, 20, let alone 160 years, it's going to need to evolve its products and services in order to meet the needs of, of its customers. And throughout the years, you may have some, some years are more about like the fine tuning, the salad years of the product, like it's pretty perfect, it's just a little bit of a tune here and there. But some years are filled with great change and an organization needs to almost reinvent itself in order to provide something meaningful uh, to its customers. And I'd say, and, and Brandon's stats, which I loved, uh, there's a lot of financial services folks here, which is awesome. Um, you know, I think the financial services space right now is certainly in an era of, of great change. And there's probably a number of different variants on that. I think you know, digital commerce is changing. There's monthly, if not daily, or weekly uh, new entrants into the market that are shaking things up. I think we're still definitely dealing with the ramifications of the 2008 financial meltdown. And the thing that I'm personally most interested in, uh, I think we're probably both really interested in, is the upending of what does it mean to provide banking solutions? And not just like bad customer care call stuff, but like really humane uh, banking uh, services to customers, particularly uh, to folks who are really underserved and I think sometimes taken advantage of by the market, the things that are out there in the market today. And so American Express is, you know, we're like 50, 60,000 people, so we're a pretty big company. And so there's lots of kitchens that are baking up some pretty interesting new services. But Shannon and I want to share a little bit of what we've learned in one of those kitchens over the last two years. And we're going to talk about some of the processes that we've employed in bringing human-centered design into that dialogue and into that dialogue of change. Uh, you know, participatory design will come up as an example of a tool that we've used to help facilitate that dialogue. Uh, and then I love the, the comments about emergent culture because responsive bagels are actually a part of our emergent culture. Um, probably doesn't make any sense now and it probably won't make much more sense uh, about 20 minutes from now. Um, but we'll, we'll tell our story in, uh, in three acts and it's actually from two perspectives. So, Kind of in the introduction, you know, as an employee of an American Express and Shannon as a consultant with Moment, and our organizations have a pretty unique and powerful working relationship, and so we're going to tell the story uh, with those two perspectives. And the first act is starting where you are. This is totally like my mother speaking to me. Like, I think probably all of us, when we think of some new service that we want to provide, yeah, you know, I think in the future my eyes are closed and thinking a great, you know, reconstructed oak wood table brand new MacBook Pro with a retina display, and the file system's perfect. Everything's named correctly, the collaboration tools are working, like email, like there's a latte, where'd that come from? It's, it's, it's awesome. But that just never, ever, ever happens. You have to start exactly where you are. Uh, for pretty much everyone in the room, this is accurate. Uh, this is also probably accurate for a fair amount 
You might be Snapchatting or nudifying. Hopefully you're not nudifying uh, right now. Uh, but for us, this is where we started. So uh, the kitchen that we're, in, uh, we're a part of, uh, there's a business unit within American Express. It was started about two years ago, uh, two and a half years ago. And it's called Enterprise Growth. And by definition, or just by its name, you, you probably guessed what we're, we're chartered with. And we're chartered with bringing new products and services to our customers. Uh, and in doing so, we hope to reach uh, new demographics that we've been unable to reach in the past, uh, and also new geographies. And the product we want to talk about today, there's many that we, we have in market, is a product called Serve, which is a, a digital prepaid account as well as a banking alternative. Um, but it's actually, it was actually founded, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's based from a, techno, uh, from a platform perspective on a company called Revolution Money, which American Express acquired about two years ago. Uh, they're based in St. Petersburg, Florida, and we're, we're based in New York City. And this is what the product looked like right after we bought, right after we made the acquisition. We came up with the Serve logo, and there is and, you know, an inordinate amount of time and, and discussion and uh, you know, and what font do we use, and, and how does that work? But the product that you see here uh, essentially is Revolution Money, right? It has a new logo on it, but this is the, you know, the iPhone and the, uh, the web screenshot. We also had an Android app and a Windows Phone app and a Facebook app. But what I just want to call out as a starting point is that we have a product that's in market, right? And decisions had been made. So the navigation, there is discussion around navigation. How do you label things? How do you group features? How do you deal with notifications? The list goes on and on. Uh, but it's not just about those decisions. You have code. Right? These things are not living in isolation. Someone has actually had to go and code that. You had to have a code review. And you have different channels, so you have different service layers. And you have a QA process and a release process. So it's not just a matter of looking at the iconography and how it's structured. We have code to deal with here. Uh, also, uh, compliance and risk, I, the financial services folks in the room probably know exceedingly well what I'm talking about, uh, but we're in a pretty regulated environment, and so being compliant with those laws is really cool if you want to be a legal company, and, you know, and not, not get into trouble. Uh, and you also need to manage risk, particularly around financial products, and while it certainly adds some time to your release schedule, what actually is really interesting is you know, it's not just about managing things like people trying to launder money through your system. You need to manage the risk for your company itself. Uh, but also, clearly, and most important, you want to manage that risk for your customers. You know, they, it is their system, it is their information. It's that stuff that we want to just guard with our lives. And you also have an existing team. So now we're getting a bit of a theme here. We have a product decisions. We have code. We have compliance and risk. And we have teams. And as a new business unit just getting started, you know, we have Revolution Money coming in from an acquisition. We have folks from American Express, folks from outside who are being hired in like ourselves. And just a, a personal story, about six months in uh, to my new role, I went down with one of my colleagues to the development team, and we had a lot of ideas about how to you know, change the iPhone app. And we had a great meeting. I think we ate probably a lot of pizza, had good dialogue. We're like, yeah, this is exactly what we should do with the navigation. But then afterwards, got some feedback. And he's like, it's great. We've done, but we've done three of these designs in the last six months. We've changed this again. And you're the third group of people that come in here and buy us pizza. I, I don't know if you're going to be here in six months. You seem cool, but I, I don't know. Uh, and that was a failure on our part. You know, it's not just about the product, but there's people who created those products, and they have an emotional connection to it, and they have a way that they got there. And the fact that we just went straight and just looked at the design and not the organization that was supporting and delivering it was a failure on our part. Uh, processes, I think probably many of you have seen a number of process slides like this. Uh, I, it's, it's rigged. There's no design in there. It's totally, I found one. No dollars. Uh, but you know, there's an existing process uh, in, which, in which an organization is delivering things. And there's a lot of misconception about what design is. And I, I think we were lucky in that design was very well, uh, it was, there's a lot of respect and trust for design. And we were hired, we were brought in. So it's not that people don't buy into it. It was, well, we have requirements, and then we have coding. And you know, design happens off here, and then it comes back, and then we do this. But design, and I love this image. It's from the HBO series Girls. You ever watch that? A couple? No. It's about a writer in New York. She lives in Brooklyn. She's going for this job interview. 
and at a blog, and she gets sat down by this, uh, you know, the editor, and she's like, this is where the magic happens. You need to get out of your comfort zone. And I think this is a, a standard thing, probably a lot of us have seen this in our day to day, is that they think like design happens in this magic happy place. And the point being is that design does not happen exceeding well in that happy place. It needs to be integrated, it needs to be a part of that process. And so in closing on this first act, uh, it's just a recognition that we learned was everything has to, everything is there for a reason. Don't just assume that someone made some decision for nothing, like they actually, and, and reach out and learn and try to understand why, and that's a good point before you can move forward. And the last point I'll make is just focusing on the assets you have. I know risk and compliance for me coming in, I got really nervous and cagey about it, but I found out like they are trying to solve the exact same problems you are, right? And so if you can work together and actually cate those assets, you can do something amazing. And so that's where we were, and Shannon's gonna talk a bit about where do we go from there. So the question became, where do we start? Jacob talked about, you know, you start where you are, which, which is totally true. Um, but we were really trying to change the perception that design wasn't something special. It wasn't something that happened magically outside of the organization, but that it's shared. It's shared within the organization. So where we started was with our team. Um, our team being Jacob and a few folks on the sort of budding customer experience team within Serve, and then a group of five designers at Moment. Um, and we really took a look at, you know, how do we want to do this? And quickly realized that um, what was key was visibility within the organization. Not just going away and, and working together as a core team to come up with a process and, and changes to the product that we're going to work and then doing this big reveal at the end. It was about talking to people and talking to each other constantly. We were, you know, we're really lucky because we're about a 15 minute walk away from each other in Soho. Um, but we were spending, you know, almost every day together, either at our offices at Moment or over at Serve, um, just getting to know the organization and where people were coming from. And, you know, that was an interesting process for us because it was a little bit messier than some of the the product design processes that, that we've um, employed in the past. Um, some of our designers were you know, presenting ideas through sketches that I hadn't seen um, to, to Jacob. And you know, it was just very fluid and very um, important that we were kind of all on the same page about really just jumping in and getting messy and, and doing this thing together. And, Again, you know, you don't ever have this sort of clean slate and this, this ability to stop and, and pause what's going on within the organization and step back and reimagine the process that's really going to take you from point A to point B. Um, you have to keep shipping. There's this expectation that, you know, we're going to be improving the customer experience, the user experience as we go. But that's really a blessing because that's how you learn. That's how you learn about who you need to talk to and where they're coming from, and learn about the constraints of the organization, which are different for every organization. Um, and it's really about that respecting the context that you're, that you're working within. I mean, we talk a lot about context as, as designers, um, but when you're trying to introduce a new process, that's, that's important, it's so important to really understand the context of the organization and the teams that you're working with. So, saw the screen earlier. This is sort of where we started the reskinned revolution money. Um, and if, actually, a few weeks after we came together as a team, the new site redesign launched. So, decisions were starting to be made about, um, you know, priority of, of product features. Um, and, but basically, this was, this was a, a reskin as well, of, especially of the, the iPhone application. And over the next six months or so, we were really tasked with making incremental improvements to the product, to the user experience, um, and, and starting to make decisions around where we wanted to focus. Because it wasn't about stepping back for six months to a year and doing a, a full site redesign. It was about focusing on things like engagement, registration, the really fun, exciting things, improving the ad money flow. Um, <laughs> But 
through doing that, we got to work with all of these different teams. We got to work with the developers, um, both in New York and in St. Pete, um, risk and compliance, as, as Jacob said. And you know, the important part about that was really changing the dialogue through doing. Um, we do a lot of, uh, we, we actually started with you know, some really traditional sort of core design tools like personas and design principles and writing scenarios and designing to that. Um, and, and that's all really important, but this is what the deliverable is here. This is one of my favorite moments in the process early on where um, as a team, we were tasked with sort of rethinking the transactions experience, how users would, would deal with their transactions on the product. And we realized we didn't, we didn't know a lot. Um, we didn't know sort of the underlying framework of where this was coming from. And rather than sitting together in a room and just going through a BRD, reviewing requirements line by line, we brought a group of folks together to sketch, to use personas and to draw out ideas on what the experience should be. So who you see here are some of our developers, some systems analysts, some researchers, marketing folks, and, and design and product as well, getting together to sketch out ideas. And what came out of this um, were, were two things that I think are really great. One, we all had a better understanding, our team coming out of it, of what are some of the constraints that we're really dealing with here. Um, you know, it wasn't just a, a blue sky concepting phase, it was really understanding what are some of the underlying constraints and opportunities that, that we could take. But it also created this, this really cool vision within the core team. By core team, I mean the developers that were actually going to be building this thing, um, that they were in it from the beginning. They were talking about where the design should go and wh what the vision for that experience was going to be. And that was, that was just a really powerful moment in the process. And then there's food. Um, so <laughs> one thing that uh, we do every month or so is a retrospective, which is something common in agile software development that we've sort of borrowed from that, where we get the team together and talk about you know, what's working, what's not, not with the product, but with the process itself. And one thing that kept coming up was food. This, <laughs> Like people just giving kind of, it was kind of a joke, giving the project managers um, some grief for not having snacks in these really long meetings. And actually Jacob came up with this really great idea. Let's take the food thing and, and really run with it. Um, so now we do these potlucks every couple of months where everyone on the team, you know, the ex kind of extended team makes a dish we have lunch, they have themes. We had a New York theme, we had a comfort food, we had Thanksgiving. Um, and it's really a chance to kind of step outside of the day-to-day the -day, you know, conversations around the product and have, have a discussion, get to know each other. I mean, it seems like such a, a basic thing, but you know, it, it's really about building that culture and, and building the team and you know, just a, more, a larger conversation. And then, you know, we've already talked about participatory de design within the team, but also, you know, what we've always tried to do is make our users our partners as well. Um, this is a sketching session that we did with some users um, early on in our redesign of our dashboard. So we brought, brought in some sketches that we were thinking about, but really sort of empowered them to tear them apart and, you know, help us reimagine what would really work for them. But another cool thing about this session was that because it was sort of last minute, um, we were pulling resources together to, to facilitate these user testing sessions. We had some product folks that were taking notes. Um, one of the project managers was actually doing the video capture in these sessions. So it was including everyone in the testing process as well. And you know that was something that that a lot of them had never really been involved in. And all of these things come down to this really 
basic fundamental um, principle of trust. And I think the point that, that we like to make here is that trust isn't built in a six-week project. Um, it's, it's something that really is built over time. It's built going through those um, product releases where the thing that you've been working on doesn't ship. You know, it's working through the process and together and really working out the kinks and building that trust. Um, this is sort of just a snippet of our extended team doing some portraits over the holidays last year, but it just, you know, we have people from Moment here, people from um, the core serve team and some of the extended serve, serve team as well. And just one last point is that, um, you know, not everyone has the luxury of being co-located. Um, you know, we're really lucky that we're right down the street, but we also have this team in St. Petersburg. A, a bunch of the development team is, is still down in St. Petersburg, Florida, so how do we bring them into the conversation as well? Um, it's simple things like picking up the phone instead of emailing making sure that that's happening on a weekly basis, even if you don't have any, anything to talk about. Um, and then going, going for a visit. Um, this is some of our designers and product folks going down to St. Pete to share some early um, prototypes of what we're gonna talk about next. And there's food involved, of course, again. But, um, but yeah, just really making sure that that conversation is, is happening. So in summary of Act 2, um, just respect the context. Really try to understand where, what you're coming into. Um, and I think this, this echoes what Jacob talked about in Act 1. And do that through shipping. Um, we've learned so much from just going through the process together and those bumps along the way. And that trust isn't built in six weeks, it's really every Every release that you do, every project, every sketching session starts to build that trust and lays the foundation for bigger changes. And so it's great. We're now all in the trust tree and we're well fed. That's great. And you know, we're all getting paychecks and, and that's, that's, that's fantastic. And we've shipped some incremental but meaningful improvements. But now what? We need to prove it. And so. I think one could argue that the incremental improvements, even the stuff that you've seen, you could do that in the magic happens outside. You can get an agency and they could have made probably similar sorts of decisions. But as Shannon was talking through, we would not have had all those experiences. We wouldn't have had those joint sketching sessions. We wouldn't have had some of those failures working through that stuff together. And so now you have a team that has that, that dynamic. And all that knowledge and learning is not outside sitting somewhere else going on to help someone else or maybe even some of your competitors. It's there in-house, and you have that, that shared knowledge and that impact on your culture. And so, example we'd like to talk about is what did we do with that knowledge, and how do we apply it? Um, and this is where we found ourselves, this is probably really clear, right? Yeah. This, this is where we found ourselves last year, um, and we were looking across our different channels. So we had web channel for serve.com, we had a mobile channel, iPhone, Android, Windows Phone app, and Facebook. And we knew we didn't have the same features in each channel, but we went through an exercise and mapped out what are some of the core capabilities we have uh, and where are they uh, manifesting themselves in these different channels. And we didn't expect, nor would we want them to be the same across all, but we were like, holy shit, this is wrong. This is, this, this, we can't, this can't be right, so what do we do, right? And so we came to a decision, I think, that a lot of organizations are coming to. I know it's a bit controversial uh, in the design community. We could have a whole separate conversation around responsive but we felt this was an interesting, while not a silver bullet, was certainly an interesting way to help solve some of that problem. And we we'll, won't we'll get into a lot of the details, but the two reasons we felt it was really interesting, one is it forces you, uh, it's not just about mobile design first, it's about designing for the entire product and service offering at the same time. You can't just design for web or one channel, you need to think about them together. And then secondly, it was really development. You know, the fact is we can then combine, at least in our architecture, multiple service layers and multiple code bases. And once we get the original uh, up front and delivered, we can then uh, yield some pretty interesting efficiency. Um, but I promised it, the responsive bagel is here. Um, 
So there's a, uh, a gentleman Dan, named Dan Shulman. He's our group president. Uh, he's like CEO from Priceline and, and Virgin Mobile. Uh, he's been with us since the beginning of, of enterprise growth. And he loves coming to the office at like 6 in the morning and walking around, right, and seeing what's happening. Uh, and I'll steal again the kind of the idea of emergent culture that's happening. Uh, we actually had, it's become kind of a mascot for responsive web. We actually had a responsive shark that sadly, as a balloon, deflated over time. Um, but then we got a responsive bagel. He actually has a badge. You can't really see it very well in this picture. Has a Wi-Fi connection, but ironically, he's kind of petrified at this point. He's been around long enough. But it's a cultural meme. It's, it's not just about a product or a service or an approach. It's actually something that's actually uh, becoming a part of how we think about things, and it's also part of the playfulness of the organization. And that was great. We were really excited. And this is actually a slide from a, a deck that we presented. We're like, Shan and I did a couple high fives, like responsive. We solved it. Like, well, now what? There's no, there's no roadmap to it. It's not like it's been done a gajillion times. So what do we do? Uh, and so what do we do? We just start. And I think uh, Richard talked about some of these process diagrams. <laughs> um, but you know, everyone starts with a plan, right? And I think, you know, especially with responsive, because it was new to us uh, as designers, and it was new to the organization, um, it was really figuring out like what, where we just wanted to put our first foot forward. And um, this was sort of borrowing from a, a couple of other people who have gone, had gone through the process. But we quickly you know, threw that out and <laughs> realized that it was more about this really fluid process um, and staying really scrappy. And the, the point that um, I want to make here is that we wouldn't have been able to do this. We wouldn't have been able to kind of have this really fluid process that was around you know, doing things out of order. Um, you'll see code first, documentation before extension. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but we wouldn't have been able to do that if the, the previous year hadn't happened, if we hadn't been building trust within, within the organization and having conversations with people that sort of laid this foundation. And at the core of this is really discuss, discussing and sharing. Um, and, and listening to how people were reacting to this idea of responsive. Um, so these are essentially our wireframes. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why we didn't actually need to document this stuff anymore. Um, these are our designers just sort of working through the ideas um, to, to come to a point where we could share them in code. And the other thing that we did that was a little different was documenting very early. And this wasn't necessarily about documentation just to hand off to development. This was a communication tool. Um, so what this, this photo is representing, we have some sketches up here. These are really early concepts that we were working with. Um, but we are starting to identify interaction patterns in the concepts that we had. So this one is you know, about how is the user seeking additional information? Is it through a tooltip? Is it going to another page? So we actually started to build an interaction pattern library very early on, before we even had the concept fully baked. And what this did was, one, it kept us honest, making sure that we were de developing a really tight system that we could then take forward. And not just us, there were other designers in other teams that were going to be using this system. But it was also a way to start a conversation with the organization, with the developers, start to develop this shared vocabulary around these patterns. Um, and ultimately, you know, having these patterns supported by code that could be reused. <laughs> and then this is, this is sort of our process that we started to call design, design development, um, which is basically everyone crowding around our very excited front end developers <laughs> monitor and working through the designs in code. And this is you know, so, sort of core to what Responsive is. But the important thing about it to the organization was that we were able to show each step of the way how this thing was evolving, and not just show it in static screens and static concepts um, on these really thick documents that were sort of passed around through email or you know, thrown away. But 
these are all screenshots of the prototype that we were building. And the one in the upper left looks pretty interesting. Um, it's, it's just text and a bunch of form elements on the page where you're starting to just put the building blocks together. But we shared that with senior leadership. And it probably freaked a few people out, <laughs> like, what are we doing? Um, but then to be able to see this evolve over time and have a conversation about it as it evolved uh, was, was really powerful. When we got to this point, I mean, everyone was bought in. And so I know we're, we're pretty much at time, so I'll try to, to, to wrap it uh, relatively succinctly. But you know, just to double down, this is like our only duplicate slide, build it. I mean, that's really the essence of it. And what you're seeing here is a sneak peek. Uh, we talked about a few kitchens, the kitchen we're in. This is uh, our responsive cake that's in the oven. It's the toothpick's still not coming out clean just yet, but it's, it's getting close. Uh, but we're really excited. And, and the, the fact that we've been able to build this and what you're not seeing here is the detailed wireframes and specs. What you're seeing here is essentially production level front end code that's in the process of being integrated. And what's interesting is that it's been able to change the dynamic across the board in how we talk to people, I mean, even in QA, as an example, now that we have front end code, it's something that we can actually start writing automated t test scripts on, which can then start to shorten our development cycle, shorten our release cycle, which becomes really interesting. And as we start to look at, as we summarize, as I summarize the final act, you know, showing and telling is, I think, in everyone's nature in this room. I mean, we, we design, and as designers, we create visualizations of very difficult problems, and we get something out there for people to react to and create a dialogue. Uh, and also, obviously, the other part about that is listening. And as Shannon alluded to, you know, when we have front-end code and we have these prototypes, we have the actual thing to react to, it creates an amazing ability to have a different level of discourse. Because if you're emailing a 70-page wireframe document to someone, you might get a reaction around the edges, but you're not going to have a meaningful conversation with what the service is and how it can be provided. And there's a number of different people who aren't necessarily have design in their title who can provide a lot of feedback to make that thing even better. Uh, and then the last point we'll make is you just, you never know where a bagel will take you. Um, we didn't know where a response would take us. We thought it would be pretty interesting and it would yield a better product, but it's completely shifted how we work, how we talk across the organization, the development tools we have. And I think it's also, speaking of starting where we are, this is now where we are. So we have these tools and it's opened up a different uh, type of avenue or horizon for us moving forward and the things that we can do with ServeNext. But thank you again. Thanks.